we're very fortunate to have Dr. Finger with us, who has a long uh, history in looking at Asia as a researcher. Uh, he's been an analyst, both within the government, but also in the academy, and has written a number of uh, scholarly tomes as well about Asia. So uh, we've got uh, an expert of some note, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, what he has to say. And, and tonight's uh, topic of discussion is the Belt and Road Initiative, otherwise also known as One Belt, One Road. Uh, and really, we should start off by uh, describing a bit about what this is. Uh, and really, w I think everyone understands one belt, I mean, rather one road, but what is one belt? Well, f let me add my word of welcome and thanks to you for coming out tonight and for your interest in world affairs. That one belt, one road, maritime silk road, belt and road initiative, and a number of other descriptions all refer to the same cluster of activities. It's not one thing, it's not one plan, it's not one program. Uh, it's basically a very ambitious, uh, very expensive, and pretty risky undertaking to build infrastructure kind of out from China through Central Asia, South Asia, and the belt part is maritime around Southeast Asia. So. It's a part of what I think has been described as the going out policy. It's a part of building infrastructure to increase uh, economic activity. Um, so, uh, and if I'm not mistaken, it was Xi Jinping who really was the initiator of this concept and, and has started uh, promoting it. Xi Jinping now owns the idea. <laughs> uh, the idea of building an integrated infrastructure network in this part of the world is very old. It goes uh. back many decades, uh, it didn't happen. Uh, it didn't happen for lots of reasons. I think one of them is the numbers never made sense to, to build. Uh, before China and India had developed to the extent that they have, the numbers may make sense now. That I say Xi Jinping now owns it, that the projects had begun, the idea was floating around, but in uh, 2013, in two speeches, one in Kazakhstan, the other one in Indonesia, he declared what became known as the One Belt, One Road uh, uh, initiative. It has now been written in the Chinese constitution. It's identified with him. Uh, if you want to get support f for a project, you can do it. Uh, I'm carrying out Xi Jinping's directive here. Uh, so if it works, he gets credit. If it doesn't work out, he's on the end of the branch all by himself. Wow, well, and that branch is a very expensive branch. Yeah. I mean, I, I've heard numbers like $1.3 trillion being floated. Is that approximate, or is it just hard to really pin down what some of these numbers are? Uh, the numbers themselves don't, um, it, it should be, taken not with a grain of salt, but as an indication, this is a very expensive undertaking, however it uh, shakes out. And whatever the numbers are today, they're not connected to any detailed project planning. And projects of this scale, the one thing we can be pretty sure of, there'll be cost overruns. But th this is in the trillions of dollars for what has been brewed as a part of the plan. So when this plan is being put together, I, we have to look at it in multiple ways and, and with multiple interests mm -hmm. that are engaged in this. I imagine, of course, you have to consider what the domestic interests are in doing this, and I imagine some of that is to develop the uh, western parts of the nation. There's a regional component to it, and of course mm -hmm. there's a global component. Maybe we can break those sure. down and, and start with the domestic and how building infrastructure, we're familiar with this in California, how building infrastructure uh, will aid uh, both in unifying the state perhaps uh, politically, uh, developing it economically, uh, unifying it uh, perhaps culturally as well, uh, whatever those, uh, mm -hmm. those aspects of, of the domestic interests are for, for Xi and for the nation. Well, I think that my starting point is that when reform and opening began at the end of 19... 78, 
China's infrastructure was almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. uh, there was very little that uh, needed to be replaced, had yet to be amortized. They had as close to a blank sheet as one can imagine. Right. I mean, you think back to some of the pictures of Beijing, and it really is bicycles going down, I mean, in the most developed parts no. of the city. When I started going to uh, Beijing in the 1970s, you could go 10 or 15 minutes between cars passing on Ten on month. Right. So month. understanding that level of yeah. where, we're, where we're talking about and, and the scale and the and the time frame, uh, which we're talking about, is really astounding. So in order to push ahead with the export-led growth, the Japan model or the South Korea Taiwan model of growth, to get from factory to port, you had to build ports. One of the first, you had to build rail lines. You had to build roads, and. Th a lot of it was Japanese-funded uh, infrastructure uh, construction, which as it began to go into place, China began to develop the capacity to build infrastructure. As they got good at it, they built more of it. Uh, it became a jobs program of sort. It became a, a way to demonstrate high rates of G uh, GDP growth by investing money in infrastructure construction started on the coast, because uh, that's where most of the people and all of the factories were. Gradually, it moved into the interior. And the, the point you raised about tying the western portion of the country, which has lots of vast open spaces and not very many people, uh, to the coastal areas, uh, you really need high-speed uh, rail, or you need a lot of airports. Um, they adopted a field of dreams approach, build it and things will, will develop. Um, as one travels around, a lot of these are pretty underutilized mm -hmm. um, a, at the moment. Uh, but among the lessons that Beijing learned from this, it's a good way to deal with industrial capacity. Now, excess capacity, well, I'll come back to that. Uh, it employs a lot of people. It creates opportunities for people, ordinary citizens, rural citizens to move to the country, to go back and forth, to move goods. Uh, it really does all of those things that infrastructure is supposed to do. So a portion of the motivation for this is to take China's experience and transfer it to others. It worked for us, it can work for you uh, to develop portions uh, of the neighboring, uh, neighboring countries that also have very poor infrastructure or have infrastructure, Central Asia, that's tied to Moscow, not to east-west. Right, and of course it's something that we're familiar with here in the United States, the question of infrastructure. We saw the development of the interstate highways, of course, early on in the 20th century, and the development of electric, uh, rural, uh, rural electrification, which also had a, a huge impact on developing of other parts of the country. And of course it is the buzzword today right. in the uh, current uh, Trump administration, this idea that we will in fact spend a trillion dollars uh, to build infrastructure which is sorely in need of repair mm -hmm. and new infrastructure, whether it be airports and the like. So um, so the fact that this is a model is not something that should be surprising or even scary to anyone in, when we look at the development of these domestic infrastructural projects. Uh, but of course, as you intimated, uh, that model is one that they want to export as well, and this is in a, in a regional uh, fashion. And again, something that the United States has a fair amount of experience in doing mm -hmm. uh, early in the 20th century, in the mid-20th century. But let's look at how it now extends in, in the Chinese model. Uh, uh, an illustration of the pre-announcement of the Belt and Road Initiative uh, were projects to build pipelines, uh, gas and oil pipelines, into uh, Kazakhstan with the initial ones, that China became a net importer of oil for the first time in 1993. It's right about the time that the border disputes with Kazakhstan and other Central Asian states were, were resolved. There was a, a desire to have an alternative to shipping oil out through the 
old Soviet, now Russian pipeline system. So the Kazakhs were looking for a new market. The Chinese had a new demand, mm -hmm. but there was no way to get it there. Uh, so large project to build a pipeline, started and stopped a few times. Um, that as the price of oil went up and down, this became a sensible or nonsensible uh, project. That a different motivation for China and partners on the other side were the minority peoples, frontier peoples, the, the names differ, but they're folks from ethnic groups outside the national majority, so non-Han in China, non-Kazakhs in Kazakhstan. And they tend to live in border regions. And they were left behind by the development model that was oriented towards the coast. They became dissatisfied, they became alienated. Um, and the Chinese feared an insurgency, a separatist um, uh, problem being larger than it was. So building infrastructure as a way to give them a bigger role in economic development and modernization. And it was faster and cheaper at the beginning to build short infrastructure across the border and let the ethnic groups interact in what was called a suitcase trade than it was to link either of them to the heartland uh, of the countries. So it started out turning borders from barriers into bridges that could link people, and it was done as much for political as for economic reasons. That's really astounding, and it's really an interesting political example of how do you change the facts on the ground mm -hmm. um, in an area which could have created, as you say, political tension in the center, uh, as well as uh, dissatisfaction with those uh, with those populaces out, out in the countryside uh, or in the border regions. Um, and I imagine as we look around those borders, it's a model that the Chinese will try to uh, use again. Is it something that we're seeing in some of the other border areas, not just the Kazakh border area, but uh, but south and north of the? Yes, um, the. Uh, Construction of infrastructure uh, into South Asia um, actually was more extensive earlier. And, and the, the terrain is more difficult. The Indians, for partly economic, I think partly political reasons, neglected the reason. The South Asia was the least integrated portion of the globe. That India didn't act as a, a locomotive for growth until the Chinese began to build the infrastructure, and it completely changed the economics of the region, you know, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, Pakistan, because the economies of scale. They could now interact with one another and with other parts of their own country in ways that they couldn't do before the infrastructure. And that the Chinese built it was nice, um, and it was built to benefit Chinese companies and Chinese interests, but the benefits were widespread. So there's receptivity uh, in the region to building these projects because uh, they're able to see the, cha the positive change that it brought with it. Wow, well, so far it sounds pretty terrific. They've right. uh, built these things, they've uh, taken care of some political issues, they're developed, they're an engine for growth, economic growth in regional areas where we hadn't seen it before. But there seems to be a fair amount of criticism as mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. about the Belt and Road Initiative. And there are those who actually say that it is, a, uh, it is an attempt by the Chinese to, um, and that's both the party and the leadership, to uh, present a model that is a political model as well to the rest of the world and to sort of force it upon some of the other areas mm -hmm. in which they are now uh, creating an indebtedness, uh, whether it be through the building of infrastructure or um, because of political favor that they're trying mm -hmm. to curry. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe if you can address that a little bit sure. and talk about those challenges. Let me, before doing that, let me put two other motivations that I think are important here to understand what the Chinese uh, are trying to do. One is they've got very substantial foreign exchange reserves, most of which are sitting in New York. Mm -hmm. um, they don't want to bring them back to China because they've already converted them to Chinese currency once on the books. They're afraid of inflation. They, they bring $3 trillion in, they're afraid of, uh, of inflation. 
uh, very afraid because they remembered that's why they won the Civil War. It was hyperinflation. A second is excess capacity, excess industrial capacity, cement, steel, construction equipment. And having built the infrastructure, built overbuilt housing in China, there are tens of millions of people who work in the construction industry looking for something to do. So the combination of money that they're not, they choose not to use in other ways that's available, excess production that depresses prices. Uh, in the case of steel, we're watching play out in the news every day some right. of the consequences. And unemployed workers who otherwise would be unhappy. So if you can build, and that's not like the uh, aid programs that the United States, that Japan, that European have, have used for decades. Um, that, that it goes back to 19th century thinking about exporting uh, the excess capacity uh, and hoping to gain some political benefits. And of course, we called it dollar diplomacy yes. in our country. The Japanese called it yen diplomacy. Didn't work for us. Right. It didn't work for Japan. I don't think it's gonna work a whole lot better for the Chinese. Let me use that as the opening to briefly respond to the other part, the backlash and yes. the concern about it. That when countries uh, around China thought this is terrific if the Chinese pay for it, if this is gonna be a gift, of course we will take it, I'm delighted to take it. As the cost, even on paper costs, began to go up, and folks in China began to ask, why are you spending money giving things to countries that have a higher per capita GDP than we do? Um, and with that uh, and, and other factors coming in, the decision to turn these into loans, mostly loans. And from a Chinese perspective, they're being generous because they're offering below market rates. Mm -hmm. It's back to the point I made earlier. Why are market rates high? Nobody thought they could be paid off. Um, so the Chinese offering lower rates might be easier to pay them off, might be able to build more, but countries that would receive the loans have begun to figure out that the opportunity cost might be very high. To pay back the loan for the highway, the railroad, the bridge, the port, whatever, might use up all of the money that would otherwise go to health care, education, social security for aging uh, populations and uh, environmental protection, all of those other things that governments do. So they're beginning to look in the mouth of the gift horse yes. and decide it may not be so attractive. The other aspect is, as the Chinese want some assurance that they're gonna be repaid, they are asking for debt for equity kind of arrangements for concessions that begin to raise nationalist hackles. Sure, there are cases where ports are being turned over, is that right, isn't it Sri Lanka? Sri Lanka. It's where in fact the debt load was so high that the debt for equity was in fact the 99 year lease for right. one of the ports in Sri Lanka? Yeah, uh, Hambotota. Um, it has an interesting history, that if, if yeah. uh, take, a, take a minute, because it illustrates what I think people are anticipating, maybe overgeneralizing from. But the Chinese negotiated a deal to build this port in Sri Lanka. Um, I suspect that some money changed hands here. Uh, bribes paid in order for it to happen, but I don't want to assert that that's the case. But when the president who concluded the deal was voted out of office, <laughs> his successor said this was a corrupt deal. We're not going to honor it. After all, it was being built in the hometown of the previous president. Um, some time passed, maybe some more envelopes changed hands, I don't know, but the project was restarted. It now more or less completed and it's not used that the port in Colombo was adequate, is still adequate to handle all of the commerce 
for Sri Lanka. It's not that big a place. So the Chinese now have taken over a debt for equity swap in the form of a 99-year lease on a port with no traffic, um, which begins to look like a white elephant. It might also, though, become a naval facility. It's, it's there. It's built. The Chinese have expanded their naval capacity. They've got the lease. Watch this space. Right. So the Indian Ocean and some of the opportunities that may exist there as they're looking for this maritime right. uh, belt mm -hmm. uh, may be just gotten a new uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, interesting because as you, as you look at this, uh, there are two questions that arise. One is uh, the countries to which you are, as China, loaning uh, uh, the question of governance of those nations is an important one, as let's say in Sri Lanka, where the potential for uh, corruption mm -hmm. uh, because of the structure of the state and its uh, and its at times inability to uh, to hold up to democratic norms mm -hmm. uh, is the case. Uh, but also, secondarily, and this is something we've seen in, in the West, in Western Europe in particular, uh, when you have these types of loans, there's always the potential for default. Um, and I, with a long Greek last name, I am very familiar with uh, some of the issues that Greece has gone through with its, uh, with its lenders. Mm -hmm. And, of course, they were not allowed to default um, right. uh, because of their membership in the Eurozone. But uh, there is nothing to prevent those who have lent from the Chinese state to not consider the potential for default. Yeah, let uh, me come at it from two directions. The Chinese learned lessons in Africa because that's where they started making uh, grants, uh, grants with concessionary loans. And the Chinese discovered what Europeans and North Americans discovered that countries that can't pay don't pay. <laughs> um, uh, and we have a whole category called highly indented, indebted poor countries, and the loaning countries basically wrote it all off and then imposed new conditions for new loans and what they can do. An anecdote on that, I've been going in that China for a long time, uh, dealing with the mainland literally since ping pong um, in 1972. Um, and shortly after I had retired from the U.S. government, I was in Beijing, and uh, an official friend said, we need your help. I said, I assume you mean the United States, not finger. Um, and I said, yeah, that we, for decades, um, uh, took great pride and made a big deal of saying, we attach no conditions to loans and grants. We don't interfere in your internal affairs the way the imperialists do, the Soviets used to, the Americans do. Uh, no conditions. So that was fine when we were playing with your chips. Mm -hmm. Now we've got billions of dollars of our money and hundreds of thousands of our people. We can't not care about the quality of governance. We can't not care about the ability to recover the investment on this. What do we do? Well, that's uh, a big uh, question. Uh, it was a big question. <laughs> um, what they are doing with the Belt and Road reflects some of the lessons here, looking for collateral, looking for constraints. But as I joked, a different time with Chinese, <laughs> what are you going to do when a country, I use the name, but I won't hear, when they can't pay and they tell you, you want your bridge? Take it back. <laughs> you want your road? You can have it. Uh, it, it's pretty hard. It's pretty hard to recover if you've loaned money on these kind of projects. Wow. Okay. Well, so, you know, you build this infrastructure and it really doesn't, it's not portable. It oh. is, uh, <laughs> you, you are, you have it in the ground. Um, so then if we look at some of these other larger political concerns that we hear about today, and I think they've become even more pronounced since the recent change in the constitutional structure of the Chinese and with the um, a rise of Xi Jinping's power uh, with the reduction of, well, with the elimination 
of term limits, constitutional uh, elimination of term limits. The question of sort of these larger strategic goals, mm -hmm. the Chinese model, uh, the Chinese dream, uh, as we look around uh, the world and see not only uh, an increase in uh, going out with infrastructure development, but also increases in military spending, uh, what you'll hear regularly from the uh, current U.S. administration is the concern with the uh, stealing and mm -hmm. uh, of intellectual property and of military technologies. Um, just the other day, we saw that the president stopped um, the uh, takeover mm -hmm. of an American technology company, Qualcomm, by Broadcom. So clearly the fear is there, the rhetoric is mm -hmm. exacerbating, the, in, the, um, the conditions are changing. How do we look at all this and, and, and put it into a context that's not fear-mongering, right. but that is realistic in terms of how uh, China does see its role in the world and how it is uh, manifesting that vision? Yeah, I mean, it's both an interesting and an important set of questions. That, and my starting point is we like to make sense out of developments. I mean, as human beings, we like to find patterns. We like to find integrating themes. We want to find a string to put through the beads so it all makes sense. A fair amount of the commentary about China's Belt and Road, um, about its vision of world order and so forth, I believe is an imputation of design and strategy and purposiveness that doesn't exist. There's an awful lot of decisions made for different reasons by different players, different times, that, that the, uh, I hinted at some of them. They got money they can't otherwise spend. They've got excess capacity they'd like to use. They've got unemployed workers they'd like to, to put to work. They have regions of the country they'd like to, to tie together. Um, that they need resources uh, that they can't acquire easily without the infrastructure. Add to that, of course, they want international prestige and influence. Uh, this is a way uh, that has proven useful to them, that the Chinese think spatially. I see lots of Chinese in the audience, but they think spatially, I think, more than Americans typically do. And interior lines of supply that are safe from depredation by an adversary. So moving from sea-based to land-based routes has a tradition in China that lots of things feed into this. I think there's much more of a company that wants to go abroad, so they say we're part of Belt and Road. There are banks that are willing to lend money to make Xi Jinping look good. That's much less than a, an integrated strategy. Will it increase China's influence? Yes and no. Uh, that uh, it gives them a bigger stake, it gives others a bigger stake or a different kind of stake in the relationship with China. But the caution and the backlash and the learning across borders that is taking place that will limit China as it has limited other players. Is China bigger? Absolutely. Has it got a bigger military? Absolutely. It's more engaged all over the world. If you look at the map, if we had it, that Belt and Road area, uh, the sea-based portion of that is the energy coming from the Middle East to China. China is very heavily and going to remain very heavily dependent on energy from that part. And the other is goods going to China's largest market, which is the European Union. Right, right now, they are all protected by the U.S. Navy, the Fifth Fleet and the Seventh Fleet. Chinese for understandable reasons, think they need a capacity to protect their own international trade. They don't like being that dependent on the United States. Frankly, I'd like them to pick up some of the responsibility <laughs> and the cost uh, of doing this. But what they would view, and what we view of ourselves, is this is a very sensible, defensive maintenance of stability in the international order, 
Um, you can turn it around and say it also has an offensive capacity. And some of the things the Chinese have done is in the South China Sea to use that military capability to intimidate smaller neighbors doesn't look very appealing. Right. And, and one of the things I take away from your analysis also is that we outside of China tend to look at the state and the party as this monolith without these internal um, difficulties or challenges both to the power structure but also the diversity of the mm -hmm. country itself, the regional political players who are also competing uh, within the state. But, uh, but, as, but part of the reason, of course, is that it's very difficult right. to look at China in that uh, more nuanced way when you're outside <laughs> of it because it doesn't allow us right. necessarily to look in and understand uh, what goes on within the country itself. Um, I have a few questions here, and uh, you know, it, 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 and I'm they're from the audience, and um, it actually raises uh, this question about infrastructure investment because there was this uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, Bank mm -hmm. which during the Obama administration we most decidedly did not join. Some of our allies did, mm -hmm. uh, and then there's also a second bank, the Asia Development Bank, and so one of the questioners uh, asks about the difference between these two types of banks, but I'm really curious about the AIIB. Mm -hmm. um, we decided not to join it. As I say, other, other allies did. Was that a mistake? It was a huge mistake in my judgment by the Obama administration that um, uh, the explanation that they gave was they wanted to make sure that this new bank would meet the same kind of standards now followed by other international financial institutions that reflect the lessons learned from the not non-repayment, um, that infrastructure investment didn't have the spillover benefits that had been anticipated. So uh, this was a classic case of the quest for the perfect driving out the good, uh, and it played out in a way that made it China won, the United States lost. China's rise, the United States in decline. China's smart, the United States is stupid. Uh, all of these are exaggerations, but the basic purpose or motivation for this bank, I think, uh, uh, are a few that I've mentioned. One is by going to a multilateral investment bank, China gains the cover of operating within a multi, we'd love to give you this loan with no conditions, no collateral, but our international partners insist upon it. Um, that uh, part of it is that China has come increasingly over the years to see that multilateral organizations are not automatically hostile to China's interest, it can be a good mechanism for advancing and promoting China's interest. As a major power, China's starting point was like that of any major power. Uh, the purpose of multilateral organizations is for the little guys to tie down Gulliver. That, and China didn't want to be constrained. It's now when if you play a leading role, you can use this to your advantage. Uh, and the a third one that I'll mention here is the desirability of building infrastructure. And if it's multilateral uh, development bank, there's not the same backlash against China-imposed uh, conditions. I think it's a good thing. Uh, it turns out to not be very different than the Asia Development Bank, which is based in Manila, largely funded by Japan. It's not that different than the World Bank or the uh, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. One of the things that goes all the way back to Adam Smith, if you want infrastructure, it almost certainly has to be built by governments. Companies don't build infrastructure. I can spend all the money to build the road and you're gonna drive on it and you didn't pay for it. So it's one of these public service functions that governments do. Uh, having another bank, and the Chinese have several others that are involved in the uh, uh, New Development Bank, which used to be called the BRICS Bank. Um, they have, they're large, if not the largest, in some of these contributors of input. They've got the most votes. Uh, 
the final point I'll make on this, at the time the AIIB was uh, proposed and then created, there was a fight going on over voting ranks, voting rights in the International Monetary Fund. Uh, China wanted to have more votes because it has put more money into the fund. The United States backed China's uh, desire for more votes. Where were they going to come from? The Europeans, who put in a proportionally smaller share. Europeans were not happy. The Obama administration supported China. We cast our vote in the IMF, and Congress dragged its feet for a couple of years before it passed the enabling legislation. While that was going on, there was an incentive for China to vent its dissatisfaction by starting its own bank. Right. Interesting. Well, you know, this question of multinational organizations and whether they're tying down Gulliver uh, is one that seems to be quite topical in the United States today, but also mm -hmm. affects China in particular when we think about the Trans-Pacific Partnership, mm -hmm. uh, something that during the election was uh, a whipping boy uh, by uh, President, by then candidate Trump. Um, since entering into office, of course, he refused to join the uh, partnership, and TPP uh, has since been signed on to by the other members, right. and, uh, and the United States remains outside. How do you view TPP both as uh, what it often was presented as, which was a bulwark against China, but secondarily as an institution and as a, and as a uh, multinational uh, agreement that would create, in many ways, and, and achieve many of the things that uh, the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, is uh, purporting to achieve. Yeah. Um, let me ease into it by saying I think the Trump decision to pull out of the TPP was even dumber than the Obama administration <laughs> not to join the AIB. Um, this is one that, uh, something that the U.S. had pressed for for decades, and we finally got it and walked away from it. Uh, a second is the way in which you described it as a bulwark against China that also had some integrating. That is the way it has come to be seen. In my view, that was not the original motivation, that the motivation here was that the World Trade Organization, a sensible Let's have a, one set of rules for the whole world. Uh, that way, uh, major trading countries can uh, operate with predictability. I guess it was 13 years that the Doha round was stalled is to bring agricultural and services into the World Trade Organization, the areas where the United States is the most competitive country in the world. India and a few other developing countries blocked any progress on that. The highly developed countries in Europe, Japan, North America, said, we got to do something else. And the something else in Asia was the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and Europe was TTIP, um, trade and uh, transatlantic Trans trade and investment yep. partnership. North America, NAFTA was key. It's the hinge to both of these. If we're in both of them, we're not going to agree to one set of standards for Asia and a different set of standards for you. So it would have the effect of setting global standards that a much smaller number of countries would decide this, but the countries in this negotiation accounted for more than 80% of world trade. Um, so the ones who stayed out would have little choice but to go along with this. The United States was not very interested in TPP. It was proposed initially by four small countries because they, together they amounted to less than 5% of U.S. trade. When Japan said it was interested because it fit with Prime Minister Abe's desire for a way to justify domestic economic changes that he thought, and I agree, were necessary for Japan, he's willing to go in the United States, for example, hello, we've been trying to get these bilateral talks with Japan, opening up the markets to these things for decades without success. We got them in TPP. Um, and the portions that have been dropped out, I think it's 22 articles, have been dropped out of the 
comprehensive agreement of which we were part uh, by the 11 that stayed in. Those 22 all brought direct benefit to the United States, um, uh, particularly in Japan. The uh, second, second biggest one was with Vietnam. That was there a part of this intended to counter China, contain China? I think it's a small part. But it wasn't so much as a contain China, keep it from rising, as it was, we need an infrastructure in Asia. Unlike Europe, which had all kinds of organizations, and that uh, Asia is uninstitutionalized. Um, building a security community like NATO to be the backbone and the anchor in Asia has always been said to be a non-starter. It probably is a non-starter. Part of the reason it's a non-starter now is China doesn't want to be part of a collective security arrangement. It wants all bilateral uh, and no, no alliances. Um, but this was a way of tying countries together so the institutions would interact. If the institutions are interacting, they have a common stake. They have shared interest. If they have shared interest, they're going to take common and joint action to protect the security and stability. That was the logic, and it was open to China. Now, Xi Jinping at uh, Sunnylands asked President Obama about joining, and uh, he gave the correct formal answer. As far as the United States is concerned, sure, you gotta, but you got to ask the organizers of the, which did not include the United States. It was Brunei and Singapore and Ecuador and somebody else were the original four that set the terms of it. But there, there was and is no reason that China uh, couldn't join. I frankly think it would be easier for China to meet the conditions than it was for Japan. Wow. So we messed up on AIIB. We did even worse on TPP. Um, what is it that the United States is doing right in, <laughs> in regarding uh, the relationship with China, the rise of China? It's, in, it's uh, you know, we look at it as a rising state. It, obviously, it is becoming an economically uh, dominant player. Uh, its GDP is rising. It's bringing up hundreds and thousands of people out of poverty. Um, there are a lot of good stories mm -hmm. that we mm -hmm. can tell about uh, about the Chinese state at this at this juncture, um, but we live in a dynamic world with right. relative power. Uh, we're we're competing for that power as well. What is it when we look at the current state of the United States, whether it's diplomatically, militarily, or economically, that the United States is really on the right track uh, uh, as uh, as it as it relates to China? Yeah. Um, the prologue to this is uh, I'm, I'm not the most objective observer because I was involved in doing a lot of uh, the policy going back to the, uh, the Ford administration. Ford and Carter, I was one of the unofficial trial balloon guys because I was a kid and easily disavowed. And then I was head of the China division in the State Department and, and then more senior positions. China has evolved pretty much as we anticipated it would. Uh, now, there are some that think we created a monster here. But the, the frame here is in 1978, uh, a year and a half after Mao died, became clear that China was going to launch a very different approach to development. It became known as reform and opening. Uh, became clear in the United States, if they did that, we actually would have a way to engage with them and, and shape. Cold War looked like it was going to go on forever. Nixon and Mao shook hands. We become tacit partners in the anti-Soviet struggle. We didn't expect anything else from China other than it would stay where it was on the globe. Uh, they didn't expect anything more from us. We didn't, they didn't have changed political system, economic system. By 78, they wanted to change. They wanted to follow an export-led growth model, uh, the Japan model, which really was the Taiwan model, but they couldn't call it the Taiwan model. <laughs> um, um, in order to do that, you had to have access to the free world. The term sounds quaint now. 
But the most advanced countries, the OECD countries, the liberal world order was confined to the United States and its allies. The U.S. was the gatekeeper. China wanted to come in. The U.S. decided to let China in without meeting any kind of preconditions other than play by the rules. Same rules apply to you uh, in this rules-based system. Logic was, if we're going to have a partner in the never-ending struggle with the Soviet Union, better to have a strong partner than a weak partner. We don't want to carry these guys. We want them to carry their load. Um, so we enthusiastically assisted, supported the drive for modernization, uh, made available uh, technology transfer opportunities for training, investment, and encouraged our allies to do so. Allies were willing to do it or eager to do it for competitive reasons, access to the market. China had very different expectations than we did. Okay. That uh, I'll, I'll simplify them with bumper stickers. China's expectation was get in, get rich, get out. <laughs> you know, use this to jumpstart modernization that China would then handle on its own. Uh, and that it would change as little as possible, only as late as necessary to keep the development bicycle upright. The American expectation was good luck. If you come into this system, it's easy, it's cheap to come in. But as you benefit, you're going to become more deeply enmeshed in it. The more you become enmeshed in it, the higher the cost to you of leaving the bigger your stake in the system. Um, that part of the expectation turned out to be realized. I don't, uh, uh, a secondary one was China would follow the trajectory of Taiwan, of South Korea, to some extent of Hong Kong, of modernization creating a proliferation of interests that have to be managed in the political system. In fact, I'm holding up uh, the cover of The Economist that yeah. talks just about this, where the cover story is how the West got China wrong, right. and it has a picture of Xi Jinping saying that that, in fact, was right. part of the expectation. That was the expectation. I don't think anybody thought it would take as long as it has. Uh, the Chinese thought they'd get out, and they'd be disengaged from this sooner. Uh, we thought the transition would occur faster than four decades. We were a little giddy by the mid-'80s because of the people power revolutions and so forth. I actually think the likelihood of that transition, a transformation occurring, is still very real. Uh, I think trying to be economically modern and politically not is just not, not going to work. That is a headline, by the way. <laughs> so maybe you could expand a little bit on that, because that really is not the common right. or, or the uh, popular understanding of what, in fact, is going on at this moment. That, I'm not sounding too crude here, but being modern is a little bit like being pregnant. <laughs> you are or you're not. There's not degrees of being pregnant. There's how many months along, it's different, but you are or you're not. And if you're modern, you can't be partway modern. It's a, it's a holistic set of relationships and expectations and rule of law and independent courts uh, and, and the like. China has moved, sometimes by fits and starts, sometimes grudgingly, uh, sometimes very cautiously, along a pretty steady trajectory that bogged down a decade ago because the next steps are hard. China had a very smart approach, in my view, which was do the easy stuff first. Gain confidence, build momentum, reduce political opposition at home, and learn from it. The problem now, four decades, there's no more easy stuff. It's all fundamental structure of the system relationship of the government to the economy, government to the society. And I certainly don't expect that China is going to come out looking like the United States or like anybody else in particular. It'll come out looking like a different China, 
on it. But it's reaching a point that uh, on two dimensions, where one is per capita GDP, which moves around uh, the threshold as every as global earnings go up, but it's now about nine thousand a year, which is associated with the transition to democracy, like South Korea or Taiwan. That if you get less than that, it, democracies don't seem to be sustainable. China is almost there. Wow, uh, it's not automatic. It's, the other is that about that same level of. Uh, GDP, per capita GDP, is middle income. China is now firmly in the middle income category. It aspires to be a high income country. Um, I'd like them to become a high income country. We make a lot more money trading with rich countries than with poor countries. Um, but getting out of that middle income level, middle income trap, turns out to be very hard. That World Bank, 1965, there were about 50 countries in the middle income category. In the, all the time since, 13 have graduated. And the only one of those that graduated that has more than 30 million people is South Korea. Now, maybe it's going to be easier with 1.4 billion people, but maybe not. Uh, and the, the internal challenges are huge. Managing the social expectations, societal expectations through the political system as growth slows is a huge challenge for China. And it seems that the reaction is to go the opposite way right now. It's to, in fact, try to use technology, yep. the political system, yep. the party structure, to, in fact, do the equivalent of a crackdown right. on the pluralistic stresses and pressures that can bubble up from a society that is increasing in its educational opportunities, uh, mm -hmm. in its GDP um, numbers. And so uh, there is this inherent conflict that we're observing right now. It's an incredible dilemma because the, the Chinese leadership fears that loosening up, uh, allowing popular expressions of discontent, excessive criticism, what they would regard as excessive criticism, of the system will jeopardize growth and slow it further. They need stability, otherwise companies will go somewhere else because uh, China's not the only game in town anymore. Um, there are now dozens and dozens of low-wage competitors, lower-wage competitors. So they've got few tools in the toolbox. They're repressive tools. Right. Um, they're trying to buy time in the hope that they can grow fast. Um, and then it'll be easier to make those tough societal and political changes. They probably missed the window of opportunity when growth was very high. Uh, demographically, there were still more Chinese who were old enough to remember the bad old days and kind of cautious about. Now, the vast majority of China's population has no memory of anything except very rapid growth, um, a, a rising China. Uh, and they're all single kids um, that never had to share anything. Um, their expectations are very high, and their family's expectations are very high. And like kids everywhere, they said, don't tell me what you did for grandma. What have you done for me lately? And trying to contain that in order to grow out of the challenge is the strategy that Beijing seems to have adopted. It's a high-risk strategy. It's, uh, so it's fascinating because uh, we don't have that nuanced understanding, I think, in general, whether we read the daily press or even uh, with our own understanding and exposure to the country. But it seems to me that other countries who face similar challenges, and I'm going to push you on this a little bit because uh, Turkey, for example, mm -hmm. uh, has, at least in the urban environment, uh, where high growth um, educated population, but what the leadership there has decided to do is actually play to the countryside. Right. And that in fact the party or the leadership can find that support that it needs, not necessarily right. in Beijing or Shanghai, but maybe in the rest of the country. Yeah. Um, 
uh, I mean, it's a wonderful question because it underscores, you know, none of this stuff is automatic here, that the urban-rural uh, ratios in Turkey and China are quite different. That China has gone over this 40 years from being a highly rural to a majority urban country. And the urban population for China is more problematic because they are in close proximity, they're connected on social media, they're more educated, they're more middle classes that demand more of it. Rural areas are very dispersed and less dependent on a smooth working system. In Turkey, you've still got huge numbers of people in the countryside that are not so dependent on government performance, are more easily swayed by a populist um, a political leader. And, and all of the Turkish people, urban or rural, I think have a good reason to be mad um, at changes that they made in order to gain admission to the European Union. Um, which making changes which they regard as uh, distorting aspects of Turkish history and culture for the prize of getting into the European Union, and the European Union did not allow that to happen. So there's backlash against Europe, there's backlash against modernity, and Erdogan is able to speak to that in a similar way, in my judgment, that Mr. Trump is able to speak to the, the portion of our own population that is most disadvantaged by the growing inequality in our system. So really the headline there is this urban-rural uh, divide. Uh, we are looking at a highly urbanized right. society with very different demands on its political leadership. And even if social media is not being, or is being controlled to the degree that we assume it's going to be controlled uh, going forward with AI and other, it doesn't matter because you're inches away from your next door neighbor That's and exactly talking right. on the street. That's exactly right. And cities are fragile places. Cities are wonderful places. Cities produce 80% of the wealth in the world. Um, if you're in a countryside and you need water, you go out in the backyard and you get it. You need food, you can grow it or get it from a neighbor. If you're living in a city and it's snowing and the gas goes off, you're stuck. If the trash isn't picked up, it's unpleasant. Uh, there are just more things that are provided either by the government directly or by um, companies that are organized for the community and the society that have to work very well or they haven't worked at all. Um, if the water treatment plant doesn't turn sewage into potable water, you got a problem uh, on it. Uh, so the people who live there, because they're more vulnerable, are more prone to demand action right now. It's not a, maybe it'll fix itself in a day or two. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I used to spend time in Los Angeles, and I remember also that an urban environment can create a great amount of pollution. Yes. And so uh, <laughs> that seems to also be one of the major problems within this particular uh, environment in this particular country. Yeah, although the Chinese have reported considerable progress over the last few years in reducing this um, small particulate uh, dimension of, of pollution. I'm going to China on Monday. Uh, so I'll see how much better it is in Beijing since I was there in November. But the moving of factories out of Beijing and, and a number of other cities has moved the pollution somewhere else. Uh, that, that it hasn't solved it, but it's moved it. Um, but the cities with the vocal populations are better. And the other is moving out a lot of people. That the migrant, so-called migrant populations, those who technically still live in the countryside, have come to cities in search of jobs. They don't have any rights in the city to health care, education, and the like. And they live in substandard housing, and they burn coal. They're not connected to the gas lines and so forth. That in Beijing and other cities, they've cleared out hundreds of thousands of these people and sent them home. Um, I, again, that's a pretty unpleasant way to be 
moved. Um, and we certainly couldn't do it here, but they can do it in China. Well, thankfully, we're not doing it here I in guess. the United I States agree. of America. I like where I live, and <laughs> uh, I have relatives who are visiting who like visiting me in San Francisco mm -hmm. as well. Um, you know, talking about uh, Belt and Road Initiative this evening has been fascinating. It's given us an insight into how the Chinese state is expanding not only its, uh, its excess capacities and financial wherewithal, but also some of its ideology and some of its uh, interests, political interests. Uh, but really, some of the most fascinating part of tonight's discussion has been a look at the internal uh, structure of the Chinese system, its, um, its populace, its internal uh, conflicts and uh, pressures. Mm -hmm. And I think that will define, in many ways, how the United States will be able to deal with uh, China, because if it is a strong, unified, supportive uh, state that has the um, the underwriting and under and, and and popular support of its people, then you're looking at a very strong nation with resources right. and increased military power that can assert its and even imply its uh, its ideology and its power to other parts of the world. Uh, it's been a great. Uh, evening to have uh, this discussion with you. We're going to continue on with some of our questions afterwards, but this brings the radio portion mm -hmm. to a conclusion. We'll uh, open it up to some of your questions, and uh, I look forward to fielding some of those, and I'm sure Tom looks forward uh, to answering. And thank you for the questions, and I'm not sure which were yours and which were relayed, but they're very good questions. Thank Combination. you all.